Welcome to 1850 Main Street, a place where friends get together and talk about their country and hope for a brighter future. Your hosts have built this spot over the past 40 years, meeting every day with people who are in the headlines and behind the real stories. Today, Rob Walgate and Alan C. Duncan from the Public Square are joined by David Zanotti, the CEO of the American Policy Roundtable. Since everyone knows both of the presidential candidates and almost everyone has strong feelings about them, what's keeping us from knowing who's going to win the election right now? Over the weekend, I was in the car with my wife and we were talking about work stuff. And she said to me, she said, you know, and she knows all the voter information projects that we do, iVoters.com, so much that we talk about on the radio. She said, I... I just feel like heading into 2024 that you're not as consumed with so much of the information aspect of voting in the November elections years past. I said, really? I said, because I feel like there's so much data out there that we're consuming and that we're working on. And she said, you know what? Maybe it's just the fact that for the second presidential cycle in a row, um, we, we kind of know who the candidates are way up front. You know, 2016 was a free-for-all. Yeah. When you think of the debates, you had the kids' table and the adults' table and the Republican <laughs> debate. Yeah. Um, you had the pre-debate, post-debate, all that uh, when when it came to participants. And even on the Democrat side, you had uh, different people vying for that. And in 2020, it was a little bit more defined on who it, who it would be. And in 2024, obviously, I mean, it was over before it started from the primary season. And, and then her and I got into discussing, I said, well, there's never been any more information that could possibly be on the two candidates running than there is in 2024, as far as exposés, articles written, oh, really looking to attack people. Yeah. So people feel like they know these two campaigns, yes. they know these two candidates, there's really no surprises which in and of itself is a very different situation in regards to polling. I place absolutely zero credit or credibility on any of the polling that's out there. Zip. Not not a bit. Because I think this election will change so many times between now and November that the polls that are happening right now, they're just snapshots of an irrelevant moment. Well, you've taught me to read polling the same way you've taught me to read court decisions. As you go to the end um, in the court Work decision, back, yeah. yeah. And in the polling aspect, you do that because you find out the methodology in which they use the poll, right. who they polled when they polled, and what were the exact questions exactly. that were asked. Yeah. Don't look at the snapshot in the beginning that gives you the headlines that may be confusing and misleading. Look at the actual data. Yeah, and, and that has a, a lot. So this is a very interesting uh, set of circumstances uh, because we are in a very unusual situation. The only time we've had two presidents technically vying, we have to go back to Teddy Roosevelt to get two presidents. Um, uh, when, when Teddy Roosevelt tried to come back in and challenge Taft uh, and the Bull Moose Party and the three-party uh, situation, I mean, it, you got to go way back in history to see when people felt like they knew who they were who the choices were, and they knew them well enough, they didn't need any more information. Like we could have the election today and it's not going to change from where it's going to, but, but the dynamic of this election being given the age of both candidates and statistical predictabilities, uh, let alone both these people are are sort of anomalies for how far they've carried their careers so late into life, um, things can change. I mean, like we could be one trip and fall away from this whole thing being changed in any direction. And it's been interesting to see the comparing and the contrasting. I mean, here you have people, you have one candidate that's been making um, statements as a government official for over 50 years, as an elected government official yeah. for over 50 years. And they're comparing and contrasting in the statements, even some he made as little as two years ago with what he's saying as uh-huh. we go towards the election that uh, contradict themselves and yeah. they do the same with Donald Trump from his first term. So Joe Biden's never had trouble contradicting himself <laughs> going back 50 years, uh, but he's always been very glib and managed to figure out a way to talk his way around it, through it or out of it. But, but, uh, but yeah, but you're right. I mean, there's a, a huge record. I never even stopped to think about how vast that record is. But again, any of it could change in a moment. Yeah, overnight. And, and you know, Robert, let's bring up another really big issue, and that's. We've never had a national poll 
Uh, and in some ways, the presidential election now is a national poll uh, with, with teeth, with consequence, because you go out and your poll, your response is your vote. And I think people do take voting seriously in that regard. They do know that when they, they pick this person, if that person wins, it's going to result in impacting their life. This isn't just a popularity contest. So this isn't just a family feud. Uh, there's, a, there's a reality to this that is sobering. Uh, and, and I think American voters still appreciate that. But I'm not sure we've ever had a situation where the real subtext in all of this is who's more likely to survive the next four years. And that's scary to say out loud and talk about, but it's Kennedy, reality. So, um, Alan and I were having that conversation not long ago. Like if people were telling you the CEO of their company were at this age and they were looking for a replacement and they came to you and said, oh, we have two strong candidates and we want these two can- one of these two candidates to run the company for the next four years. These are our finalists. We'd, we'd look at them and say, those are your finalists? <laughs> Do we really have that many options on this one? (laughs) Another excellent question. And this is a historical analysis on this. Now, we can say anything we want to say. I mean, we don't particularly want to ever say anything that makes people think we're trying to nudge them into voting for candidate A, B, or C. We just, or D, or whatever. That's not who we are. That's not what we do. We don't care. (laughs) <laughs> Actually, surprisingly, in some states, I'll bet there'll be five candidates. Well, yeah, oh, there'll be there'll be more in some, and and yeah. obviously with RFK being on the ballot in a few, you will have three viable options, and that could have an impact in some places. Thanks for stopping by at eighteen fifty Main Street. We're glad you're here. Do you want to learn more about what is really going on behind the scenes in public policy? Tune in to The Public Square on over 200 radio stations coast to coast. Or download the free Public Square mobile app from your app store. Just look for The Lamppost. Find out what America is really talking about at thepublicsquare.com. So we've got this whole age factor, and, and that's a very significant reality. But then the other part of it is... Is there going to be? Uh, I do think some people will view that. I, I hope who walk that away if somebody doesn't choose to vote so top of the ticket, that they would still vote they don't down have ballot for all the other. Important. Either one of them is the kind of person that's going to carry this through, and they'll just basically say, um, "I think I'll let this one go. I'm just I I'm unaffected, or uh, perhaps the better term is I'm disaffected. I'm turned off by the process, and so I'm more comfortable doing nothing." Yeah, yeah, because what's true about all of this is, yes, the presidency is that national poll. uh, And people like to feel like their opinion matters in the direction of a nation. It's kind of a really cheap shortcut uh, when we get Article 2 at that level of importance uh, and and, and as opposed to Article 1 in the Congress. But, Alan, you couldn't be more correct. No matter how disaffected someone may be by the top of the ticket, I sure hope that as Americans we understand we have a personal responsibility if we want to maintain our ability to self-govern to keep the House and the Senate moving forward in, in the best way possible. Well, we were talking about this the other day when it comes to the 270 electoral college votes that are needed to win the presidency. You have a state like we'll use Ohio as an example where if polling is any indicator, you'll have a Republican win the state's choice for president and Donald Trump, and you'll have a Democrat win the United States Senate race and Sherrod Brown. And there's some people that say that could be a reality in Pennsylvania as well. If Donald Trump could pull that off and Bob Casey could, you know, retain it. Or, so or there's be lots re-elected. of ways to interpret that. You're talking about two big states that, yeah. are, that are considered in some cases swing states or, or, or whatever. You've got Ohio that has been being discussed as a red state for a good amount of time now, and people think it's a foregone conclusion. And there's that split ticket reality. Um, and there's a million reasons for things like that that happen across the country. Um, the biggest thing is that Americans segment in their imagination what it means to be a U.S. senator away from all the other type jobs. It's not like being a member of the House. It's not like running for the White House. It's not like being a governor. It's not like being a mayor. The Senate seat, the two seats that each the people treat these differently, and they treat them differently state by state. In Florida, they don't treat their Senate races the way that Ohioans treat theirs. 
And in Tennessee, they don't treat their races the way that Ohioans or Floridians do. I mean, at Floridians do. It's, it's a different thing in different states. California is different. New York is different. Um, so that's a mystery about the U.S. Senate that's very hard, I think, to poll. I think as we watch this election year, it's going to be interesting to see a dive in to some of these House races and to see how those turn out, because I th- feel like those could have some movement in some different spots, maybe some districts in New York, some additional districts in California, uh, other places around the country. They can move either way. I'm not saying Republicans are going to win all those. They can move either way. So here's an interesting thought, though, on, on how to look at this and why everybody listening matters and everybody who listens and tells somebody matters. Because, for example, we just talked about the differentiation between how New Yorkers or Californians would consider their Senate races in that statewide poll. And what are the odds that a Republican could win a Senate seat in New York or a Senate seat in California? Exceptionally low. Difficult. Very difficult. Because of the major urban centers in those two huge states, uh, number state number one and state number four in population. All right. And and you say to yourself, well, OK, then that would automatically uh, make it clear that that the House and Senate races, of course, would go the same way. So these are going to be states that are going to be completely dominated by by Republicans or Democrats. In this case, it would be Democrats with California and New York. But when you look at the contested races and here's what we've got to remember, there are 435 members of the House of Representatives and it doesn't matter where they come from when they vote. If they vote, yes, it's yes. If they vote, no, it's no. It doesn't matter if they vote yes from California or they vote yes from Alabama. A yes vote's a yes vote, a no's vote is a no vote. And if you look at the makeup of the House of Representatives, you know exactly where I'm going, and you see what are more likely to be, who will control, which party will control, which thought frames will control, what you discover is the destiny of the House of Representatives is going to come down to a dozen seats, which most of them are in New York or California. And the question is, will Republicans who currently hold those seats maintain those seats or will Democrats prevail in those seats? And you get some even crazier situations where a district that is viewed as D plus two has got a Republican in it or one that's that, that is that is uh, R plus two has got a Democrat. These become very localized races. One of the most polarizing figures in the United States House of Representatives is AOC. Mm-hmm. And let's remember, AOC won a primary to knock off a longtime incumbent in the U.S. House. So not only does it impact R&D, but it also could impact um, establishment versus newcomer. And how does that can that person hold their seat? I mean, there's a lot of moving parts. Oh, and these. Yeah. these So these seats can lurch farther in one direction or the other, or they could actually be the seats that flip control in regards to the parties. Now, we are no fan uh, at all. We are not a, an organization that 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 thinks America is served well by the partisan divide in the House and the Senate and by the powerful bosses from Republican and Democrat parties that control those issues. This is a bad thing. It's not if you if you could spend a week with us in Washington, D.C., you'd walk out saying, oh, my gosh, I had no idea it actually worked like this. And I've got a whole different point of view. It's bad. It is bad. The party boss control in Washington, D.C. is bad for our country. But it is still a piece of the puzzle because we can't get to a place yet. We have not been able to get to a place where the the desire for reform is so strong among members that they throw the bosses out. In other words, there's not enough Republicans who want a true constitutional form of government that they'll throw the anti-constitutional bosses overboard and put in new leadership. They don't have enough numbers. So they protect themselves. It's not a good situation. It's not healthy. It's not going in the right direction. And it's tough to talk about. And it causes people to be discouraged. So to think that, well, the Republicans may control, therefore, therefore, maybe, maybe not. Or the Democrats control, and that's going to be maybe, maybe not. It, 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 unless one of these two entities gets a significant majority that they can totally overcome all the rules, et cetera. It's probably going to be a very dicey game of who's on first for another two years. Well, that brings me to a question that came from a listener that I'm going to ask uh, here on the air. And they something we mentioned on 
the public square a few weeks ago as it pertains to term limits. And they want to know, is term limits in regards to Congress um, likely to come before the American people in the next 10 years? A constitutional amendment that calls for term limits for members of Congress. That's a good enough subject that I think we'll have to start a whole other episode. Let's do it. The conversations are just getting started. To get connected, check out 1850MainStreet.com. We don't data mine anyone or sell your information. Subscribe today so you don't miss a single conversation. We'll see you next time here at 1850 Main Street.